So today we go more into genetics of protein glycosylation. And just to shortly remind you, nearly everything is glycosylated. Nearly all proteins are glycosylated, and the glycans are their important structural elements. <coughs> and structurally, they're very complex. So we are talking about nonlinear structures, branch structures, and the chemical composition is also pretty much complex. So practically, we never go into full detail of chemical structures. Actually, occasionally, you don't have modifications like uh, sulfation or some other type of modifications which are making things even more complicated. So for the moment, we'll just stick to the basic structures and we'll talk about glycans as so a glycan A, glycan B, glycan C, with some little bit details of the structure. Another thing to remember, there is no gene for glycan. So you don't have a relationship, one gene, one glycan. You have a relationship, many genes create one glycan. But the same genes also create many glycans which go to many proteins. So compared to classical genetics, when you have a mutation in a protein coding gene, you have altered structure of a protein and then you have a phenotype. That's simple. Here, you have a mutation in any of those enzymes. They are affecting all the glycans which are being produced in that branch of a pathway, which are then being attached to thousands of proteins where they have completely different functions. So you cannot assign a single mutation in the gene linked to glycosylation with a defined phenotype. Usually the phenotypes are very complex. To make things even more complex, we still do not know the majority of genes which are involved in protein glycosylation. So we do know the basic glycosylation pathway. We know the glycosyl transferases, we know the glycosidases, we know the basic biosynthesis of sugar nucleotides. But what we do not know, we do not know which transcription factors regulate glycosyl transferases. We do not know which ion channels are important for a specific Golgi compartments. We don't know all the transport proteins which are relevant. We actually know very little about the functional importance of Golgi organization. Actually, when you think about it, we know very little about Golgi in general. So all this complex network is some kind of uncharted desert. This is why we have this desert on the screen. So we are working on an uncharted desert. We have few points which we know, but there are many more which we do not know. So about numbers, a few years ago, uh, one group cataloged more or less all the genes which are known to be involved in glycosylation, and there is approximately 800 of them. So 800 known classical glycogenes. But then started this large exploratory phase to see what else is involved in glycosylation, and a few years later, a Japanese group did a study on a neural specific glycosylation in Drosophila, and they realized that out of the hundred and something genes which are required for glycosylation, only 14 were the classical glycogenes. So over 80% were unknown, unmapped genes which are relevant for glycosylation. So the number is raising. Then our GWAS studies started and we identified additional uh, 14 or 15 genes which are relevant for glycosylation, but we did just a little bit of a glycan GWAS. And actually, when we try to extrapolate what we know on all the glycosylation pathways, our estimate is that it will be between 1,000 and 200, 2,000, probably around 2,000 genes which are relevant for glycosylation. So we are talking about a 10% of the entire genome which is glycosylating proteins. So this is by far the most complex pathway there is in our organism. To be able to study glycosylation, we need a tools. We need methods how glycans can be quantified. And we recently compared <coughs> more or less all high throughput methods there are. So there are several mass spectrometry methods, there are chromatography methods, there are electro, electro, uh, electrophoresis methods. And we learned actually that nearly all of them can be used to study glycans reliably and quantitatively. This was actually a big step forward because until then, people were thinking that mass spectrometry cannot be quantitative enough because mass spectrometry is actually not giving the reliable 
uh, quantitative data, but it is doing reliable relative quantification. And this is sufficient when you want to do type of a GWAS studies. So when we go back to our first large scale study of the glycome, we did a HPLC analysis then. We had a relatively low resolution power, so you could get maybe 10, 15, 20 peaks on a single chromatogram. But we already learned a lot about variability, heritability, environment and factors which are affecting the glycans. But most relevant for today, we did learn that it, you can use these numbers to do a GWAS, to do a genome-wide association scan. If you remember, GWAS is having a trait measured in a number of people, comparing this trait, in this case this is a specific glycan, with all the polymorphisms in a genome. And then you go SNP by SNP and look whether this SNP associates with a trait. And then you get a p-value telling you, okay, this SNP associates with a high probability or with a low probability. Majority of the genome will not be relevant for this specific lichen. So we don't see hits. But some regions of a genome will be associated with SNPs which are relevant for this glycan. Then you identify this region and you say, okay, <coughs> this region is relevant for this specific lichen. And our first real GWAS, meaning on the real nice sample set, which gives some meaningful uh, result, identified HNF1 alpha as a genetic loci which is relevant for glycosylation. So when you do GWAS, you actually do not identify genes. You identify genetic loci. Because these polymorphisms are generally not functional polymorphisms. They're tagging polymorphisms which are variable in the population. But since genes are being inherited in a big packs, actually between their combination hotpots, you know that the functional mutation which is affecting this glycan is somewhere near the region where you see the significant hips, hits. And there were several genes in this region. Most probable was this HNF1 alpha. But GWAS is only giving hypothesis. So when you do a GWAS study, you will just create hypothesis, which then needs to be confirmed. So we started to think, why do we see associations with the genetic polymorphisms in this region with glycans. So first we looked into which glycans associate with this region. Because if you remember, there will be always many genes which associate with a single glycan, and also single gene which will associate with the many glycans at the end. Because this is the way gly glycan biosynthesis pathway is being, looks like. So these are the glycans we studied. They were all uh, glycans which most associated with HNF and alpha and related genes. And most of them were somehow linked with fucosylation. So we also mapped here fucosylation stats. This is non-fucosylated, core fucosylated, non-fucosylated, and tenary fucosylated. So fucose is one of the monosaccharides. It can be added to the core of a glycan or to antenna. So we're talking about the antenary glycosylation and we're talking about the core fucosylation. And we also had associations with the two genes, which is FUT8 and FUT6. FUT8 is fucosyl transferase 8. This is putting fucose to the core of the glycan. And FUT6 is the fucosyl transferase, which is putting fucose to the antennas of a glycan. So we have a classical enzymes, which are putting fucose on the glycans, and we know what they do. So for example, we see that SNPs in these FUT8 and FUT6 associate with majority of these glycans. And then we have a novel gene. So HNF1 alpha, we know it's a transcription factor. It's affecting a number of different genes, but it was never linked with glycosylation before. So we looked and say, okay, this HNF1 alpha associates with more or less the same glycans as FUT6. So it looks like HNF1 alpha is the regulating expression of FOT6. How can we check that? So then we did a number of silencing experiments. So you do a small interfering RNA, 
which will silence the foot uh, six, but also foot six is an enzyme which is putting fucose to the antenna. There are many enzymes which do the same thing, like foot three, foot five, foot seven, foot nine, foot ten, foot eleven. They can all put fucose to the antenna. So we made RNA eyes for uh, all of them, and also, of course, we make a control which is uh, scrambled, so it's just a random RNA eye. And there is, to make things even more complicated, in addition to HNF1 alpha, there is HNF4 alpha, which is a very similar transcription factor, which actually works together with HNF1 alpha. So they, they form some kind of a mutually supportive network. And then what we observed, so if you make uh, RNA eye silencing of a foot three of, uh, of uh, HNF1 alpha, you also have decreased expression of FUT3. So obviously HNF1 alpha and also HNF4 alpha, they are silencing FUT3. If you do a scramble RNAi, you don't see any effect. The same thing you see for FUT5 and similarly to FUT6. But you do not see effects on FUT7, FUT9, FUT10, FUT11. And of course this can be very different in a different cell lines. So we tested several cell lines, this is a this is the liver cells because most of the proteins in the plasma and we were analyzing plasma glycans are being made in the liver. <clears throat> and also we saw another interesting thing and that is if you silence HNF1 and 4 alpha, you actually have increased expression of foot eight. So the same transcription factor is promoting expression of foot three, five and six, which are putting glycans to the antenna and suppressing expression of foot eight, which is putting glycans to the core. To cut this thing short, because this was published a few years ago, we identified HNF1 alpha as the master regulator of fucosylation, because it is both promoting de novo and salvage pathway of GDP fucose synthesis, and GDP fucose is a precursor for fucosylation. You need GDP fucose to be able to fucosylate proteins. So HNF1 alpha is promoting production of GDP fucose. Also, it is blocking FUT8. FUT8 is putting fucose here to the core of N-glycans. And it's promoting expression of FUT3, 6, and 5, which are putting glycans to the core. So the same transcription factor is producing the substrate, blocking FUT8, which is a competing enzyme, and promoting expressions of foot six and three, which are here the most relevant. So this transcription factor is doing everything it can to put fucose to the antenna of glycans. Interesting thing about foot eight, about HNF1 alpha, is that if you have mutation in HNF1 alpha, you develop something called MODI, which is maturity onset diabetes of the young. So you practically have diabetes, you have all the symptoms of diabetes. You cannot control your glucose level in blood. And even a single defective copy of this gene is sufficient to cause the disease. So this is a dominant mutation which is a calling a sub, uh, causing a subtype of diabetes, which is relatively rare, something like 0.5% of the all diabetics, but approximately 5% of people who get diabetes before the age of 45, which is actually a relatively large number. So we calculated globally, this would be something like five million people a year who could develop Modi, who do develop Modi. An interesting thing about Modi is that there is a very efficient therapy. So very low doses of sulfonylurea are practically resetting the insulin production. So if you put people with a type two diabetes on sulfonylurea type drugs, you don't see actually much effect. And sulfonylurea is actually being phased out of a, as a therapy of a type two diabetes because it's not really working. So the majority of type two diabetes will get, a met, will get a metformin or something like that to treat diabetes, which is having relatively low effects. So their glucose after therapy is being decreased by maybe one millimorg per liter. But if you have Modi, and you get very low doses of glycyl azide or some other sulfonylurea drugs, 
your glycemia is practically normalized. So you can be practically cured for the majority of your life, avoid any complications of diabetes if you are diagnosed on time. And something like 95-80% of all patients with MODI are not being diagnosed because nobody is testing for MODI. They see increased glucose, it's not type 1, then it's type 2. So from our GWAS study, we learned that HNF1 alpha is master regulator of fucosylation. If there are polymorphisms in HNF1 alpha, fucose levels will be different. So if there is a mutation in HNF1 alpha, which is much stronger a factor than the polymorphism, okay, these are the common polymorphisms without clear functional effects, while these mutations are actually null mutations which kill the protein, then we said, okay, if we measure plasma fucosylation in these patients, maybe this could be a biomarker. And we were lucky to get uh, FP7 grand glycobiome, which gave us money to play with different things we want to look for biomarkers. And in collaboration with the Oxford University, we did a relatively large study on MOD patients. I say relatively large because this was altogether something like five or 600 people because MOD is rare. So you cannot get a large number of patients, which would be great, but we don't have them. And what we saw is that antenary fucose in patients with MODI is much lower than any other types of diabetes, than the controls, and only similar thing was the HNF4 MODI, which is actually a mutation in a transcription factor which is linked to HNF1 alpha. <coughs> so this was also expected. And then when you look into the so-called rock curves, which are a way to look how well a biomarker behaves, it compares sensitivity and specificity of a biomarker. And then we have this one of the key parameters, which is area under the curve, telling you how good a biomarker is, over 90%, which is nearly a perfect biomarker. <sighs> nearly a perfect biomarker, but not good enough, actually, because MODI is very rare, and even with the over 90% specificity and selectivity, you will still have a lot of false positives. But even with this, unperfect biomarker, we were able to identify in our original set of patients four patients which were misdiagnosed. So after we resequenced all those patients, we found that two of them, which have been diagnosed by type 1 and type 2, are actually MODI, so they had the wrong diagnosis, and two of those which were ma marked as MODI didn't have mutations, so they were actually not the MODI. So even with this first initial study, we were able to identify four patients which were misdiagnosed. And if you remember, MODI is a dominant mutation. So if you have it, 50% of your children will have it. Also 50% of your siblings will have it. So then we were able to identify families. And actually, as a result of this study, four people were taken off insulin, put on sulfonylurea, and they are very happy because of that. And this is something we are now trying to move forward and use it more often in our clinics because approximately 5% of people diagnosed with diabetes before the age of 45 actually have MODI and not type 2 diabetes. But in parallel, we are trying to develop better biomarkers. And we use the same approach. So we use GWAS to identify glycans which link to the genes and then try to build it into a biomarker. So our next GWAS of the, the plasma glycum identified links between HNF1 alpha and glycan branching. So HNF1 alpha is not only regulating fucosylation, it's also regulating branching of glycans. So better gly glycans will have less or more antennas. And then when we tried to combine fucosylation and branching in a single uh, classification test, we got nearly perfect classification and this is something we are working on now and we have it in a clinical trial in both Croatia and UK and we hope to really put this biomarker in clinical use. But things are more complicated because it is not only mutation in genes which affect glycosylation. It is also both current 
and past environmental factors. Because everything we have seen, everything we have experienced, is being memorized in ourselves, mostly by different types of epigenetic modifications. So genes can be silenced or activated by putting a different epigenetic marks in their either promoter regions or the gene bodies. So we do see effects of polymorphisms, which will make different proteins and they will have a different glycan. But you, have a very, you can have a very similar effect if you have a methylation in the promoter region, which will either decrease or increase expression. So through a decreased or increased expression, you have less or more of a protein, and then you have a similar effect. So we ask ourselves, can we see this type of effect on HNF on alpha? And in a collaboration with Vladka Zoldos, who will talk to you tomorrow, we identified four sites in the first exome of uh, HNF on alpha, which more or less act as an off, off, off on switch for HNF on alpha. So we analyze the number of cell lines, and if the cell line has no methylation, there is expression of HNF on alpha. If there is a methylation, like in all of them, there is very little expression. So you can practically turn the site, turn the expression of HNF on alpha off and on by putting methyl groups on those four sites in the, in the first exome of HNF on alpha. And then we looked, can we see the association between the more and less methyl groups on these sites and the branching of glycans. The problem here is that the glycans and plasma come from liver. Well, generally, you cannot take liver from people to do methylation analysis. We usually do methylation analysis on uh, blood cells which are available in blood. So these things are not the same. They do correlate. So there are a number of studies showing that the plasma methylation is a good proxy for other tissue methylation, but this is not the same thing. But even if we were looking at the plasma DNA and proteins really uh, produced in liver, we were still able to see stati statistically significant associations. So we could claim that the epigenetic regulation of HF alpha is also important for plasma protein glycosylation. And now we also speculate that part of the people who have type 2 diabetes actually have something we call epigenetic mode. So we have HNF and alpha, not malfunctional because of mutation, but it has a malfunction because of epigenetic silencing. But everything I was talking until now was glycomics. Glycomics is taking a total proton, removing all the glycans, and studying the glycans. Problem with that is that the glycans on different proteins can have very different function. So the same glycan attached to different proteins will have a completely different function. So in this way, we can actually only see relatively large genetic effects. So if there is something wrong with the biosynthesis of glycans, which is affecting the same class of glycans across all the proteins, you will identify it in this way. But actually, the majority of glycan functions will be protein specific. So to understand them, we have to do something we call glycoproteomics. So you're looking into glycans of a single protein and then trying to understand what do they do. And for this approach, we decided to focus on IgG. IgG is the most abundant glycoprotein in plasma. It is the second most abundant protein, but albumin, which is the most abundant protein, is not glycosylated. Albumin is actually one of the very few proteins which are not glycosylated. So IgG is the most abundant glycoprotein. It has a very simple glycosylation. So glycans, which can be found on IgG and with the biantenary structure, so there are no three antenary, four antenary, five antenary glycans. So these are all very simple glycans, only two antennas. And actually the key features we, which we could look at is n acetylglucosamine these are the tiny structures which end with the glucnac. Then you have the addition of galactose. So you have structures with one or two galactoses. You can have a core fucose, 
or not have a core few codes? There is no antenna if you code. Galactose can be extended with a sialic acid. So you have sialylated glycans, and you can have a, something we call bisecting gluconac. So this is the gluconac in the middle of the two antennas. So th these are the all features of IgG glycosylation which exist on IgG. And they do have very important functional uh, roles. And this has been studied by a number of groups in a number of different laboratories. So this is now generally accepted that the glycans, which are here in this um, area of the FC domain, are very important for the conformation of this domain. And by affecting the conformation of a domain, they affect binding to different receptors. Because when you think about it, once this structure is being created, other proteins, other molecules which interact with it, does not care whether they're interacting with the polypeptide part or a glycan part. This is one molecular entity composed of amino acids and glycans. So depending which glycan you put, you have a different structures and then you bind to different receptors. We still do not understand this fully because IgG is a very complex molecule. There are subclasses, there are variants, there are antibody variants. This is a key weapon we have in the fight against mi microorganisms, but we do know some elements. For example, we know that this core fucose here is a safety switch for antibody-dependent cellular cytoxicity. So antibodies, if they bind to something and they do not have the core fucose, then they will bind to FC gamma 3A receptor on the NK cells and some other cells, and these natural killers will then kill the target cell. And this is called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. This is one of the key mechanisms to, to eliminate tumor cells and the virus-infected cells. And the core fucose is acting as a safety switch because majority of our antibodies should not activate ADCC because even though they are specific, with some residual, with not residual, with some binding constants, they will bind to everything in our body. So everything binds to any, anything. It just depends on the concentration. So if all antibodies would be activating AGCC, then we would have a lot of autoimmune diseases. This core fucose is a safety switch which is preventing it. Galactose and sialic acid are enabling balance between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory action of IgG. Although IgG is a preliminary pro-inflammatory agent. It should recognize the target and kill the target. But IgG is also being used as an anti-inflammatory agent. And more and more people are now being treated with something called intravenous immunoglobulins. So large amount of immunoglobulins isolated from bloods of large number of people giving, given to a patient with autoimmune disease will reduce inflammation. And apparently, this is mostly to IgGs with these sialic acids on the top because they act anti-inflammatory. So IgG is actually, in the same time, weapon in our arsenal, but also a molecule which is being used to balance inflammation, reduce and promote inflammation. So we did a large population study of the IgG glycome. We analyzed I think this was done on 1,000 people. At the moment, we are approaching the 15,000 people target we set ourselves, then we'll do the next GWAS. And we learned that IgG glycome is extremely variable. So we are all very different in the way we glycosylate our IgG. Some of us will have 5% of this structure here. This is a key pro-inflammatory structure. Well, other people, will have 50% of the glycone with this structure. So people with 5% will be much less pro-inflammatory than people with the 50%. And the same goes with for a core fucose, sialic acid, so on. All the glycans on the IgG glycome are very variable. And something we were really surprised to learn is that this is heavily determined by our genes. 
up to 80% of the glycome composition is heritable. So this is something which was calculated by the analysis of approximately 2,000 twins. So by analyzing twins, both monozygotic and dizygotic, you are able to estimate the heritability component and the shared environment component to this whole thing. So even though there are no single genes which regulate glycosylation, complex network of genes, complex network of polymorphisms somehow define your final glycome composition. So up to 80% of it is heritable. So there has to be genes which regulate it. But it's not one gene, one glycan. It's a complex network acting together and regulating glycosylation. In our first GWAS, it was done on a little bit more than 2,000 people, identified 16 genetic loci. GWAS on a plasma glycom, on actually 2,500 people, identified only four genetic loci, while this one identified 16. This is an indication that IgG glycom is a little bit more complex in its regulation, that there are probably more genes. So when we do this 15,000 people, which we are planning to do now, we actually analyze glycans and nearly all of them already, we hope to map the entire pathway, which I hope will have between 1,500 genes. But this is just a speculation. So our first G was identified 16 genes. Out of these 16 genes, four of them were classical known glycogenes. So these were the glycosyl transferases. So we picked up FUT8, which is put in core fucose, GNT3 or MGAT3, which is put in the bisecting LACNAC, salyl transferase, which is put in salic acid, and a galactosyl transferase, which is put in galactose. So we identified genes which we expected to find. So these are the all glycosyl transferases which are relevant for the synthesis of these simple glycans. We found them. But we also found 12 other genes which were previously not linked to glycosylation. And some of them, for example, LAMB1, which is a lamin binding protein. So what does a lamin binding protein has with the process of glycosylation? We have no ideas. But we do know that this is associating with the core fucose. Also, the Icaros, EKZF1, is also associating with the core fucose. We have no idea what is the mechanism. This is what we are doing at the moment. Also, we see genes like IL-6 signal transducer. This is the signaling unit of the IL-6 and some other interleukins. We also see uh, epigenetic regulators like Bach2, Smart B1, and so on. So we are seeing a large network of proteins which associate with specific glycans. And they were previously not linked to the glycosylation pathway. But interestingly, nearly all of the, them have previously been found in the GWAS studies of a different autoimmune, inflammatory diseases, and cancer. So the genes which we now know are regulating IgG glycosylation are somehow making people more prone to develop different diseases. So what we think is that these genes actually affect diseases by regulating IgG glycosylation, because IgG is more or less important in all those diseases. And one of them, which, were, which is probably particularly interesting, was IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, because out of our 16 hits, five of them are also hit for IBD. So we identified 16 genes, one third of them is relevant for IBD. And we were lucky actually to get a grant called IBD Biome to study IBD in a large number of people, over 5,000 patients all around Europe and US. And actually we got it approximately at the same time when we got this result. So then we said, okay, let's try to focus on IBD to see what we can identify there. And so we, we know the genes associate with IBD. For example, it associates with uh, genes which associate with the galactosylation, associate with IBD. Genes which associate with core fucosylation, associate with IBD. So let's see what we can see in uh, patients. 
So IBD has two subgroups, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So we had uh, controls, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and then what we see, we see that the glycans with, without galactose are significantly increased in both groups, more than Crohn than the UC, and glycans without galactose are decreased. So one of the elements we are seeing in a IgG glycosylation, galactosylation affected by the genes which affect IBD, we actually see it also in the patient. And also we see that cellulation is generally decreased. So if you remember, glycosylation and cellulation is making IgG less than pro-inflammatory. So decreased galactosylation, decreased cellulation is making IgG more pro-inflammatory. So patients have more pro-inflammatory IgG. But interestingly, not on glycans which do have bisecting GLUCNAC. And this is something we don't understand at the moment. And we are seeing actually the same thing in lupus, which is another inflammatory autoimmune disease. And this is that patients are very different, but the bisecting GLUCNAC is interesting. And we know very little about the role of bisecting GLUCNAC in uh, IgG function. I haven't said anything about it now. We do know that uh, bisecting is preventing fucose dilation. So if you put the bisecting, you cannot put the fucose anymore. But the majority of IgGs first get the fucose and then the bisecting. So we don't really understand it. But we see it clearly being different and we think it's interesting. And we have a kind of hypothesis which says, okay, 80% of our, up to 80% of our glycum composition is genetic. So the differences we are seeing are maybe not a consequence of a disease. Maybe they are a predisposition. So maybe these people who are different are more prone to different diseases. So some of us, from a genetic reason, do not put enough core fucose. If we don't put enough for fucose, our antibody is activating ADCC. Maybe we are more prone to autoimmune diseases like lupus. Or maybe we are putting too much core fucose, again, because of some strange combination of polymorphisms, and then we cannot activate ADCC. If we cannot activate ADCC, then we are less efficient in our fight against the tumor cells. So in theory, IgG fucosylation could be a balance between autoimmunity, too stringent, or tumor development, not stringent enough control. And we looked in the other end of the spectrum. We looked in colorectal cancer. We studied something like 2,000 people with a colorectal cancer. And we did see that they are also different in this other direction. And then also we did see that uh, IgG glycosylation is a predictor of mortality. So depending on the way you glycosylate glycans, your chances of dying are being higher or lower. And we did a number of studies, a number of different diseases like RA, UC, CD, CRC, SLE, and some others. And some of them are specific, but many of them show the same type of change. And this is decreased galactosylation. So in a number of diseases, people have decreased galactose. Their antibodies are more pro-inflammatory. So obviously, this is not a disease-specific biomarker. This is not something which can be used to diagnose any of these diseases, because this is changed in all diseases. But this could be the general biomarker of something we could call a suboptimal health or uh, health deterioration. So when your health is falling apart, when your homeostasis is not really functional, then you increase inflammation. So you try to somehow reset yourself. Let's destroy everything we can and then build it again. And so, and the same thing, what I also forgot to mention, that this IgG galactosylation is changing with age. The older we are, more inflammatory we are. Now, the question is, 
how does the calendar affect our body? Does the calendar age mean anything? Because time is actually a very individual thing. We all age very differently. So we do see that IgG glycans correlate very well with age. This is actually a prediction of age, predicted age against calendar age, and we see that the correlation is very strong. But there is a still relatively large dissipation. So we looked which are the factors which correlate with galactosylation after you correct for chronological age. And then you see things like insulin, fibrinogen, glycated hemoglobin, BMI, triglyceride, glucose, waist circumference, all those unhealthy things. So after you correct for a biological age, these IgG glycans associate with something which we could call biological age. So this seems to be some kind of general predictor of the state of an organism. But things are really complicated. And we, we don't know anything. We know tiny little bits. For example, when you think about galactose, if you have a single galactose, it can be added to this antenna here, which is a three arm, or this six arm. And in humans, this is the dominant arm. So the majority of IgG glycans have galactose on the sixth arm. Interesting, interestingly, on some other organisms, some other animals, it's the other way around. So the three arm is dominant. And with age, only the sixth arm is decreasing, not the three arm. Even more complicated, glycans with bisecting and galactose on any of the arms are increasing with age. Now the question is, we have a single enzyme which is adding these four galactoses. How can this enzyme be differently regulated with age on the three arm, six arm, and the glycans with bisecting? So we don't know. We have no ideas. How can a single enzyme in the same time be down-regulated and up-regulated? We know that it cannot. So this is not gene expression. This is not enzyme activity. This is something else. This is either very complex uh, protein assembly, or what I think is more probable is some kind of a Golgi compartmentalization. So you have a different parts of a Golgi doing different things and being independently regulated. So my feeling is that all those classical glycogenes, glycosyl transferases, glycosidases, are just the working horses, just the robots doing the job. Something similar to RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase generates RNA, but it does not decide where, when, how much will it work. My feeling is that the glycosyl transferases will be the similar thing. They put the sugars, but they do not decide where, when, and how much. And for example, we see that one of the genes, Bach2, is associating only with this single structure. So it associates with addition of galactose, but only here, not on the other glycans. So maybe we are mapping a pathway which will help us understand how is this functioning. Also, we know that antibodies, their glycosylation can be clonally fixed. So antibodies produced by a subset of cells can have a different glycosylation than other antibodies, although they are produced in the same person, with the same genetics, in the same location, the same bone marrow. For example, this was a study done by Manfred, very close collaborator of us, with a specific disease when the antibodies are being produced which, atta which attack platelets of a baby, and the fucosylation of the total IgG was 94%. And the antigen-specific IgG had only 43% of the fucose. So antibodies produced in the same person had very different core fucosylation. And then there is a control experiment. Another antigen-specific IgG, anti-HLA, it had 87% of the fucose. So this is not an artifact of purification. This is the real thing that the antibodies produced by a specific clone of cells 
have much less fucose. And actually, this is uh, something I like to think of as the fixation of the IgG glycosylation during the B cell development. When you think about it, what is antibody doing? Antibody has this FAB part. FAB part is binding to antigen. FAB part is defined by the sequence of nucleotides in the final immunoglobulin gene after all this recombination which is being happening in early in lifetime. So early in lifetime you define several hundreds of thousands or several millions of different clones which have a different sequence of FAB. And you re really can't change it a lot. You can do some somatic mutations and fine tune it to be a better antibody, but this is defined. So your antibody, specificity of your antibody is defined more or less for a lifetime. And this is happening early in life. And so I have all my clones of B cells in me already. And then I meet a novel antigen. I meet an Ebola virus or whatever new, which I have never met in before. And then I, my antibodies, have to decide what to do with it. Should it activate ADCC? Should it activate complement? Should it, should it do something else? So after the sequence of FAB is defined already, I have to learn what to do with it, how to eliminate the pathogen in the best way. And then I have to remember it because I may meet an antigen again. So I have to optimize antibody function to activate the different effector functions and I have to remember it. And the best way to do it is DNA methylation. So DNA methylation is the most stable epigenetic modification. You put the methyl group on CPG islands, CPG islands activate or deactivate a specific path. And this happens sometime during development of a B cell after it meets the antigen. So you have the early B cells, after they meet the antigen, they go into propagation, they multiply, they have a selection, and at one point, they're optimal. They're making antibodies, which are the best to kill this specific invader. And IgG glycosylation is a perfect thing, which you can modify easily in this stage. You just slightly modify the IgG glycosylation pathway, and you put the different glycans on your IgG. So somehow IgG glycosylation pattern is fixed during B cell development. The question is how can we prove it? Because it's very difficult to work with cells from a person with a single clone of cells. We don't really know how to grow B cells. But what we know, we know how to make hybridomas. So this is known for more than 30 years. You can do a fusion between a B cell and a myeloma cell, generate something which is called hybridoma. Hybridoma is producing antibodies and it can grow forever. And there are millions of different clones being used all around the world. So in collaboration with Stipe Jonic in Rijeka, we went to study their immunoglobulin uh, producing cells. They have thousands of hybridoma cells in their fridges. And what we learned is that all of them, many of them, will have a different glycosylation pathway. So these are just different colors are different glycans, and this is the composition of a glycome. So you can see that this cell line is having very little of this structure, while here this structure is dominant, while here this structure is dominant, which is very little in here. So they make a different glycome composition of their antibodies. This is not perfectly fixed, because depending on the cell culture condition, this can change. But in principle, you can reproduce this type of a pattern. And then we went on to study the genes, which we know are the GWAS hits. And one of them was this Bach2, which I mentioned that it's also associating with this structure. And we said, OK, can we see an association between the different cell lines? So if some of them are making more of this structure, Oh, this one is making a lot of this structure, this is making, mu making much less, can we see association with the methylation in Bach 2 region? This is a very preliminary experiment, but it appears that we do see it, 
So for example, glycans, the cells which make a lot of this glycan have less methylation, while the cells which have more methylation will make less of this glycan. And to finish this story, genetic regulation of protein glycosylation is extremely complex. We have hundreds of genes in a pathway. All these genes will have different polymorphisms, more or less functionally important, which will affect glycosidases, glycosyl transferases, ion channels, biosynthesis of nucleotides, everything which is involved. But also, there is a lot of gene-gene interactions which we do not understand at the moment. So these proteins are somehow interacting. We have effect of environment. Even the things we eat can affect glycans. Relatively rarely, not so strongly, but there are some examples of people having a specific mutation, being unable to produce glycans. If you feed them with a lot of mannose, for example, you can cure them. But we also have past memory of environment encoded in the epigenetics, which can be either within a lifetime or maybe through generations, which is also affecting glycosylation. And this all together is making this complex pathway. And I have shown you yesterday our collaborative network and the people who work in the team. And I look forward to your questions.